Aloha, and welcome to the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection. I am your host, Gwendolyn Harris. My guest today has been called the Renaissance Man, which is a term dating back to the time of Leonardo da Vinci, who was described as a man of unquenchable curiosity and feverishly in inventive imagination. My guest, four-decade musical journey through the worlds of R&B, pop, and jazz, is the modern-day musical equivalent to Leonardo da Vinci. Starting as a drummer, he became an engineer for R&B legends Diana Ross, Luther Vandross, and Aretha Franklin. Before evolving into a two-time Grammy Award-winning urban jazz producer with over 60 number one radio airplay hits, and finally a popular guitarist, artist, and performer in his own right. Please welcome Mr. Paul Brown to the show. Aloha. Oh, Aloha. you did it. How are you? How are you? How are you today? It's great. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. I'm looking forward to talking with you as well. I'm so excited that you are here with us today. And I know some people, I've had some people ask me some questions that they want me to ask you. So some are going to be my questions. Some are going to be probably taken, you know, um, from the people that have asked me. But let's get started, okay? Hi. You started playing the drums at an early age, and I think I read it was around the age of five, right? And then a couple years later, you started with a guitar. Now, you come from a musical background where your mom and dad sang for Mel Torme, Frank Sinatra, and Elvis Presley. What was it like growing up in a musical family? Well, it was, you know, for me, it was all I knew, but um, it was great. I used to go with my mom and dad to the studios all the time growing up and uh, my drumsticks in my back pocket. And, you know, back then they did these variety shows like um, the Red Skelton show and um, the Dinah Shore show and Nat King Cole show. Mm -hmm. And so I tag along and there would be the orchestra there playing and you know um, on the Red Skelton show they had the uh, Dave Rose Orchestra Ray Brown on bass and Frank Cap on drums and I would sit back there by Frank Cap and Ray Brown <laughs> Ray Brown was going man you sure you don't want to play the bass but, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> but uh, they were such great guys and uh, my mom and dad were singers so they were um, you know, be rehearsing with the singers and the, the orchestra would be playing, the dancers would be dancing. And it was like that every week. I just figured, you know, that's the way it is. And um, so I got to witness a lot of unbelievable performances because back then the variety shows pretty much had anybody who was a star at that time for Sinatra, mm -hmm. you know, the Satchmo, Ella Fitzgerald, you know, Sarah Vaughn, on and on and on. And uh, they sang with them all. So I got to see that on a daily basis, pretty much. And, um, and then when I got older, I started going in the studio myself and started getting into the recording process and producing and so on, writing. Now, what made you pick the instruments that you play, the drums and the, and the guitar? What made you pick those? Well, the drums, I was just a little kid and my dad was working with Henry Mancini and um, Ledwig company gave Henry Mancini a set of drums and he didn't know what to do with them. So he asked my dad if, I, if he wanted them. So my dad took them and gave them to me. And um, it just so happened also that my uncle Al, Al Goodman, was a really well-known oh. drummer with Vicky Carr and some other people. And uh, so I had drum lessons from the time I was five till 15 every week with Al Goodman. Wow. He, played, he played the vibes and the drums. So you know, the way he, he taught me was like, he would write out a, a rhythm, you know, and he would play the vibes. So, and he would just jam out on the vibes while I was grooving on the drums. So from a very early age, I was, you know, playing with other musicians on a pretty high level and um, improvising and, and sort of seeing how, you know, the play between musicians works. Wow, amazing. You're so lucky. You were so lucky. Now, uh -huh. you, you started in high school at an, at an early age getting in or working as in the engineering studio, correct? What made yes. you get into that engineering portion? Well, again, it was, you know, from going to the studios with my parents, um, I would sit in the control room often 
while they were out recording. And I was like, you know, these guys, these are the cool guys. They're doing the cool job. They're engineering <laughs> and taking care of business. And um, it just always looked like something that was really fun for me. And um, I was, even as a drummer, I was already arranging the songs in my bands and writing the music. So it was kind of a natural progression. And also, again, you know, with the family, my brother-in-law, <laughs> Lee Hirschberg, was chief engineer of Warner Brothers. So when I, you know, when I could, I started working for him. Oh, wow. Wow. He gave me my start in the studio, like really working in the studio. And basically he quit playing drums at that time and, and um, started just producing and engineering. Amazing. You attended the University of Oregon and you studied music and math. Yeah. So once are, you, <laughs> yeah. huh? Are the same thing, you know? Yeah. So once you once you completed your your college career, once you graduated, you moved back to L.A. What was your first job out of college? Um, actually, with an English um, singer, Long John Baldry. Mm -hmm. Don't try to boogie woogie on the king of rock and roll, and he. Um, <laughs> came to the Troubadour in LA where my band was playing and his band got stuck in immigration in England and he was about to do a, a tour of Canada and the United States. <laughs> and he really enjoyed my band. And afterwards his manager asked us if we all wanted to go on tour with him starting in a week, going into rehearsals in the next couple of days. And we were like, wow, okay, really? Okay. Well, we, yeah, I'm kind of interested. So we went and got the record. And started listening to it and uh, learned the songs. And we were in rehearsal a couple of days later and on the road making money. And it was my whole band basically out of high school. Nice. Nice. Now, eventually, you stepped from behind the scenes, from producing and engineering and all that. And then in 2004, you, you released your first album, Up Front. What made you decide to come from behind the scenes and release your first album to put yourself? out there it kind of came as a um you know a surprise a little bit because i was really busy as a producer and had very little downtime to you know work on myself as an artist and i probably produced over 100 records at that time and um i was writing a song one day and it was this song <laughs> I was 24 seven, but I wasn't writing it for me. I was writing it for, you know, Boney or Kirk Whalum or somebody. And, and I had played it back and I listened to it. And I was like, wow, that really sounds like a finished <laughs> record for the first time. I never had that experience with me as a guitar player artist. And um, I was like, wow, this is really cool. So I played it for some people and they're like, man, this is great. Who is it? I said, well, it's me. I said, we'll do some, a few more. So I did a few more. And, um, you know, I got signed at 48 years old to, uh, to do my first record. So I kind of went in backwards because usually it works the other way around. Mm -hmm. The guys, you know, they make records for a while. They learn how to produce records and then they start producing people and whatnot. But um, I kind of went backwards, but that's, that's just kind of the way it worked for me. Awesome. Awesome. Now, when you're not touring or producing or, or playing or, or composing, what do you do in your spare time? Um, I love to golf. I you know, can see from my raging suntan from today. <laughs> I'm avid golfer. That's one great thing about Hawaii. Nothing but golf courses. And, um, and I, uh, <laughs> I love wine. And um, uh, my wife and I like to search out some bottles of wine and enjoy those. And we love to travel. And uh, we have two kids and, the, you know, we do the normal things. Normal family things. Yeah. <laughs> Got dogs, you know, kids, all that. Now, um, your wife and your kids, are they in the music industry as well? Well, funny enough, my wife, um, of 40 years, by the way, um, uh, everybody's always like, how in the hell can you stay married for 40 years? <laughs> uh, in Los Angeles, and music business, and I tell them, you know what? It's like 15 minutes underwater. No, we love each other. Um, we have a great relationship and she's been pretty independent. She's an author 
and she's done comedy and um, you know, she's worked for the LA times as a writer. And so she keeps herself really busy, but I never heard her sing until about six months ago, she wrote this song for our daughter. And uh, we have a daughter who's an addict and she wrote this beautiful song and she was singing it around the house. And I'm like, wow, that sounds pretty amazing. And then we had friends come over and she would sing the song. And eventually I just said, you know, we got to record this song. So we recorded it. And it was her first time singing, first time recording. And uh, the song, Somebody's Child, which is kind of like from a child's perspective of being, you know, an, an addict and having a home and not having a home. But anyway, that song, my record company loved so much, they put it on my last record, um, um, Uptown Blues. So that mm -hmm. song by Becky is actually on that record. And then they loved it so much, they were like, well, you guys got to do a whole record. So we just finished doing a whole record on her. It's called Love, Love, Love and uh, Jackie Brown. And it's going to come out on my record company that I, my records come out on Woodward Avenue. And um, it's finished and the single's out now. It's called Why Oh Why. And it's called Why Oh Why? The single's called Why Oh Why. The album's called Love, Love, Love. Okay. I'm going to be looking for that. I, I really want to hear that. I really do want to hear that album. I want to hear the whole album. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's kind of country-ish, Americana folk-ish. Mm -hmm. It has some, some jazzy, you know, influences. <laughs> but essentially, it's more of a country style. And um, she's Canadian, but still, she loves country music. And um, maybe that's one reason we never talk about music for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, so now, uh, you know, we're doing, you know, the nice thing is we've been doing a lot of gigs together and she'll come up and sing a couple songs. And um, so when I go on the road, hopefully I won't be alone anymore. So that's nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Now, if you did not, if you did not become a musician, what would you be doing right now? What do you think you'd be doing right now? Uh, I'd probably be a pastry chef and an oil rig. No, I don't know. I, <laughs> I really, you know, I fortunately have never had to make that decision. Uh -huh. um, when I was, you know, after I graduated college, there was a time when I thought I might go into professional sports of some kind. I was a basketball player and volleyball player and golfer, but that never materialized. And I just wanted to play music. And um, it's just been, it's been my life since I was born, basically. And I really don't know any other way to go about living, honestly. Well, I love your music, and we have to go on a quick break, but we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hey, Aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection where my guest today is Grammy Award guitarist Mr. Paul Brown and I am so glad he is here with me today or I should say via um, via Skype. Hi, welcome back. <laughs> still here. <laughs> well, thank you for still being here. Now, we were we were just chatting it up a little bit before the break. And I'd like to know, what do you feel is the best song or album that you have ever released and why? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, one of the ones, I mean, I've been so lucky because I've gotten to work with some of the most amazing artists and some of my favorite artists of all time, like George Benson, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some of the Puma said, hey, 
I want you to come and work for me at GRP. And I want you to produce, you know, the first thing I want you to do is George Benson. I'm like, okay. And, uh, you know, I got to work with Al Jarreau. I worked with Luther Vandross for 15 years. And, you know, these guys just, they're just on another planet and uh, love doing every minute of it. And, you know, had some great music with Boney James. We did nine records together, which is pretty unusual in this business and written probably over 100 songs with Boney. Um, so there's a lot of special moments. I mean, um, some of the Luther stuff is just incredible. Yes, yes. And I must say, when um, before the interview and getting to know you and all that and reading everything, I'm reading everything and I'm like, oh, he worked with Jesse J. Oh, he worked with this person. Oh, he did that. It's so much. I'm telling you to my viewers, if you do not know, you need to go to his website and read about him. It's just so many people that you would not have thought that this man has worked with. And I know why you are in a Grammy Award winning guitarist. I know. I know now. You've worked with all, all of these people. And this leads into my next question. You have worked with so many musicians. An artist, who would you like to collaborate with next? Somebody that you haven't worked with? It's kind of hard because well, you've worked with a lot. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I, you know, I really wanted to work with Aretha Franklin. And um, I really wanted to do a jazz record with Aretha. I think that would have been incredible. And um, lately, I've been actually singing one of her songs, you know. Uh, you know, uh, come back to Hawaii, you know? <laughs> I gotta play that song. There. Yes, because now I'm, I'm sitting here in the studio grooving to that. <laughs> I like a bluesy version of it. So I mean, the, the point of it was that you could take, you know, artists that aren't necessarily, because you wouldn't consider me someone that would do an Aretha song. So in the same fashion, Aretha wouldn't be expected to do a sort of jazzier song. Right. But, um, right. You know, but um, there, there's a lot of great, you know, vocalists. I like working with vocalists, honestly. And, Do you? Um, yeah. That this, it's just, you know, that's the music that I grew up listening to and, and um, playing. And uh, I didn't really get into instrumental music and smooth jazz until I was, you know, in my 30s, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I like Eric Clapton. You know, my, some of my influences are, you know, I was a deadhead. So uh, Jerry Garcia, Jerry Garcia and West Murray, I like, I listen to them both <laughs> and uh, I love them for what they do. Um, and I always say, you know, I'd rather listen to, I'd probably rather listen to Eric Clapton than, you know, John McLaughlin or some amazing technician. So that's just kind of the way I grew up. Nice. Now, if you can have your fans remember one thing about you, what would it be? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess that I, you know, I'm very passionate about music and, and luckily I've been uh, able to experience um, music that, that, that moves me and makes the hair on my arm stand up. And when that happens, I know that the record that I'm producing is done or the performance that I'm trying to get is done. And uh, I've been lucky to be able to um, to get that. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if everybody has that good fortune. So I've been really lucky. So I don't know. I just, I live and breathe music. It's sort of, you know, people always say, are you a, you know, uh, religious person? And I, I'm really not, but I'm a spiritual person. When I say that, 
music is my, you know, in my religion, I guess, because every day I'm either playing it, writing it, producing it, arranging it, recording it, or going out on the road and playing it live. So it's pretty much the air I breathe and what makes me tick. Now your latest album, um, the latest one is, kind of, is titled Uptown Blues. What made you come up with the title of that album? Well, I've been messing with, you know, I have a blues band too called Brothers Brown with another guy named Paul Brown who lives in Nashville. And um, I've been incorporating a lot of blues into my music. And I love Jeff Gallo and uh, actually wrote this song, um, Blues for Jeff, which is on this album mm -hmm. for him. And, um, and I was working with this drummer who's a blues drummer, this guy Tony Bronicle. He plays with Taj Mahal and uh, Robert Cray and others, and he's a great producer. And um, he was listening to my to my brother's Brown album actually, and he was commenting. He said, "You know, man, it's not like really bluesy. It's it's more like uptown. It's uptown blues, Just meaning you know a little bit more sophisticated than their normal blues. I have some chord changes in there that mm -hmm. most blues chord you know musicians don't use." but it still has the roots of blues. So that I thought, wow, that's a great name. So that's how it became. Uptown. That's how it became. <laughs> well, I like it. I like the whole album. Like I said, I love all of your music. I love it all. My favorite album of yours is White Sand album, which you did in 2007. I love yeah. it. Now, Al Jarreau's on there. Huh? Al Jarreau's on there and Bobby Caldwell. Yes. And Bob. Yeah. Yes, that's that's a very nice album. Now, as you know, uh, music in the schools, the music and the arts in the schools are slowly being taken away out, out of the schools. Uh -huh. So what is your thought or what do you think that we can do to try and keep it in the school so our our students or our, our young people can have, you know, to learn the music and the arts and, and be like you? Well, I mean, you know, it's all up to the parents. The parents just have to fight for it. And, you know, they have to let the schools know. They have to call their Congress people. And, I mean, you know, people just have to stand up for it. They can't just keep letting them be cuts like that. It's just crazy. You know, you go to other places in the world, and um, they have way more importance put on the arts and music in schools, et cetera. And mm -hmm. in America, it's a shame, but most states, you know, just cut. That's where they cut. It's weird. Yes, and, and it's unfortunate. Education period, you know, the, the education in this country is not what it should be, and that includes the arts. What advice would you give for new musicians or artists that are trying to make it into the industry? Because you know, some make it and some don't. So, what advice would you give them to come if they want to come into the music industry? Well, one thing's for sure: uh, you have to do pretty much everything now. I mean, if I was just trying to play the guitar, I couldn't have my lifestyle. I couldn't, this, this wouldn't be possible. You know, I have to engineer, I have to write, I have to um, record, I have to produce, I have to do everything, arrange, go out and play music, whatever I have to do, all those things. So you pretty much have to have a really good, you know, coverage of a lot of areas and very, very few people can make a living just playing an instrument and uh, god bless the ones that can but i couldn't i could make i could make a living as a producer but not as a guitarist what new projects do you have coming up you, you said a few but do you have anything new any tours that are coming up that we should know like maybe you're coming to hawaii ah, i wish <laughs> i was coming to hawaii can you make some calls for me i'll try um, <laughs> I am going, I'm, I'm playing in Portugal this year, and um, I think my wife's going to go with me on that and probably play a few songs. And I'm playing in um, South Carolina uh, September 1st, and in Atlanta um, August 29th, I think. And, uh, you know, here and there and everywhere. And um, I'm playing with some new artists that I'm producing here in L.A. at the Mint and uh, other places in L.A., like the Right Off Room. And I'm just trying to get these new artists off the ground, including my wife. But we're going to actually go to Nashville and do all the open mic, you know, just guitar, vocal, acoustic guitar, and sing in these, sing in these bars and just, you know, 
go up and down the street, up and down Broadway and do some that are set up and some uh -huh. that are not. And just, you know, play music. Nice. Now, where can people go to look for your tour schedule, to look up your biography, <laughs> to look, to learn about you? Where can people look you up? Well, I, you know, I get an email from Wiki, uh, from um, Wikipedia almost every day now. Well, are we going to set up a page for you or what? I'm like, geez. <laughs> I have a website, paulbrownjazz.com. That's my website. And um, my touring is there. My records are there. Where you can get the records, is, it's all there. But you can pretty much everywhere that records are available, the records are there. So that's nice. Okay. So you heard that, everyone. You can look yeah. up Mr. Paul Brown at www.paulbrownjazz.com. And I'm telling you, if you want to learn about this man, this awesome man, go to that website. Look up to where he's playing. And maybe we will get him to Hawaii. We're going to work on that. Yes. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to work on that. I'm going to have to talk to Mr. Paulo on that one. <laughs> on that one. But I want to thank you so much for joining us here today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, to talk with you, and to see you again. And hopefully I'll get to see you whenever you come back to Hawaii. Yes, that would be great. And um, <laughs> big love to everybody in Hawaii. Can't wait to get back over there and see everybody, all my friends. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I thank you everyone for tuning in here to the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection. Starting on June the 13th, I will be moving to 4 p.m. and I will be every two weeks. I'll still be on Thursdays, so tune in on June 13th when we'll be adding some spice and Latin flavor to the show with Eddie Ortiz and Cynthia Romero of the Son Caribe Salsa Band. And they will actually be in studio. So until then, aloha and God bless.